Armour 3 is one of the biggest tactical shooters ever made, and despite the game being 10 years old, the player count is still incredibly high, beating current tactical shooters and rivaling some AAA games. And I want to explore why Armour 3 is special to a lot of people, and the reasoning can vary from person to person, whether that is playing a co-op game with a couple of mates and taking the piss, participating in an ongoing war set during a specific period of time, or engaging in a little bit of tomfoolery in a roleplay server like Altus Life, because obviously nothing nefarious goes on there. Tontwo, put your fucking hands up, Tontwo. You're gonna get tased if you don't put your hands up. But what exactly is Armor 3? And I wouldn't say there is a definitive answer to that question since the game can be whatever you make of it, because it offers a ridiculous sandbox experience to allow you to make the game as arcade or as, as realistic and punishing as you want it to be. But the base game itself is an in-depth tactical shooter on possibly the largest scale in gaming history and of all places to set a game like this that didn't choose the war in Middle East or Eastern Europe, they chose the beautiful, safe, and financially secure country of Greece, well a former island of it. But speaking of Greece's past financial decisions, Today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a free mobile RPG that millions of people play worldwide. You are able to collect over 650 unique heroes, and in celebration of Raid's fourth birthday, I have been instructed to invite four of them to a dinner party where I will try not to burn the house down with a microwave. The first person I'd invite is the Royal Guard. In game, he can paralyze enemies and deal heaps of damage. He also has a knife to cut the meat, and that's very useful because I'm too cheap to provide utensils. The next is Wurlam, Frost King, who can provide a nice defense buff to your team. I also think it'll be funny watching him cope with the hot Australian summer and slowly melt to death. The next is Underpriest Brogni, who is coined as being one of the strongest heroes in Raid, and he also looks like he'd go hard at the pub after the dinner. The last person I'd invite is Queen Eva, because it's the most female contact I'll have in years. Alright, in all seriousness, I'm kind of of obliged to invite her because she literally gets a nuke in game. This April, Raid is going on an egg hunt. Just download Raid using the links below and copy your in-game player ID and head on over to egghunt.plarium.com and enter your ID and you'll have an exciting adventure through the flaming portal. You'll scour the dragon's lair and find the hidden egg to take a chance to win an amazing in-game items and even real life prizes ranging from legendary champions to Amazon gift cards. This event is for new players, but existing raid players can join as well as long as you go to egghunt.plarium.com and find a special promo code to earn a small gift in game. You can join me in Raid Shadow Legends if you scan the QR code that's on screen, or one of the many QR codes that I've been putting around town. We are taking an epic champion Talia and other useful things, so just hit my link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. Alright, back to the video. The base game itself has multiple campaigns that are spread out amongst various expansions and they're pretty cool. I think I gave up on the East Wind one years ago because I kept getting aimbotted by the bots and I only beat it recently and it was really good, but if you buy armor just for the campaign, you're more or less throwing money away because you ignore the true potential of the game. Obviously, I'm not going to ignore the fact that you can buy certain expansions and you can play it as a co-op experience or as a solo experience. But I want to move on to possibly one of the biggest selling points of the game, and that is realism. This not only ranges from the gameplay mechanics, but to the graphics as well. Despite the game being as old as it is, it still looks great, whether that's the island of Altus, one of the various DLC maps, or even custom made maps, visually the game has aged much better than a lot of other games. Heck, the graphics are so great and realistic that multiple news outlets have confused it as real war footage, but Armour has a pretty advanced ballistic system. This is because different calibers penetrate different kinds of surfaces and they can also deviate in their path based on the angle that they hit and depending on what material they hit. I always like it when tactical shooters model in nice bullet penetration. RS2 does it really
really good because despite being behind a concrete wall, a 7.62 bullet can still kill you, making you feel a lot more vulnerable compared to other games where you can sit inside and negate 20, 30 millimeter shells from an APC. But in armor, the effectiveness of different bullets can vary greatly, and you can imagine what happens when a 20, 30 millimeter shell that can vaporize a whole neighborhood in seconds would do to you if you're hiding inside one of these houses. But since armor is a tactical shooter by nature, all it takes is one or two bullets to end you. Now, when it comes to the movement, this is a slight criticism that I have. On one hand, you have near total control over your body. You can bend and twist like a contortionist, or consortion, no, it's contortionist, it's a big word for me, I apologize. But the actual movement itself hasn't aged that well, since it does feel stiff and clunky. Some people might refer to this as a thing called armor jank, and the old game engine doesn't really help its case because it can feel very lanky. It's what I imagine being a seven foot tall person is like, trying to be maneuverable and agile, yet you just come off as lanky and clumsy. That's how the movement can feel at times, but you can rectify the inadequacies of the movement sometimes via the use of mods. But moving on to the flying mechanics, and it's one thing that I really like about this game because it's so easy to use. A big reason why I like it so much is because you can actually look around and fly with one hand, similar to RS2's control scheme. I feel like with just 30 minutes of practice or even less, you can easily get down the controls and the flying mechanics. However, this doesn't stop a fair amount of people from trying to show off how good they are. And there are many different kinds of pilots. In armor, you'll find the first one being the ones that show off and end up crashing. And then you have the second pilots that don't say anything. They might play some music over the radio and usually the selection is good. And as long as they can land and not crash, that's the bare minimum in my opinion. And I'm pretty satisfied. But the thing is, there's no right or wrong way to play this game. If you want to spend all your time in the map editor making scenarios, messing around and placing objects in a precise way that it satisfies your OCD, then it's worth it. I reckon half the time I have in armor is literally spent in the map editor doing just that. Some people have over 20,000 hours in this game, which is 833 days or nearly two and a half years of their life spent in one game. And that's not supposed to be a dig or criticism. What I'm trying to say is if that doesn't sell you on the value of money you can get out of this product, then I don't know what will. But let's move on to the different kinds of game modes that you can find. There is practically no shortage of them, and I'll cover a couple of the popular ones that you can find in the server browser, but your experience may vary drastically. The first one I want to get out of the way, and that is Altus Life. You're already miserable in real life, so why not roleplay it? You have the good, hard, honest working civilians who are trying to make a living and hopefully one day save up to buy an attack helicopter just the way the Founding Fathers intended. Obviously, this will take much longer, or you can resort to a life of crime and rack up the big money quickly. Now, as someone like me who has to leave my private domicile to get to work in real life, obviously a life of crime in a video game is more fitting. A fair amount of what I did was just robbing gas stations, yet for some reason it takes so goddamn long to empty the till. I thought I was sexually harassing the cashier considering how long it takes. Now this is when the police or even an upstanding citizen can stop me and arrest me. I, I had what I'd assume a civilian try to perform a citizen's arrest, but I couldn't understand what dialect of English he was speaking, so I tried to get away, ended up crashing, and I was promptly tased and robbed of my loot. I wouldn't really recommend this way to play armor simply because you can get killed in the most ridiculous of ways or no role play whatsoever. I was showing my mates around and we just got assassinated. We we're playing Altus Life, not fucking Chicago Life. Someone's behind us, bro. Bro, they're shooting us. They just shot you. Bro, they just shot you. Bro, they shot us dead. The next game mode is pretty fun and one of my favorites, and that is King of the Hill. I sell propane and propane accessories, I tell you what. 
Shut up, Dale. You have three teams and you must fight for control of a zone and the people with the majority of people in that zone will receive a point over a certain amount of time. And this is until you reach the score of 100 and it can take a long time, but this game mode is a little more arcade-like because it has a kill feed and you can level up and unlock fancy stuff. In this game mode, you won't be walking for extended periods of time with nothing happening. The gameplay loop is very basic and anyone can get involved, but obviously I'm not saying this is like Call of Duty or anything. You can absolutely work as a team to absolutely dominate. The next standard game mode is Invade and Annex, and I'm not that much of a fan of this game mode since it can be pretty tilting, because getting outplayed by another human is frustrating. I've had my fair share of mental breakdowns in my gaming career, believe me. I'm convinced. <laughs> from broken mice, to nearly broken hand, to nearly broken wall. I, I know, it's a video game, it's, there's no point getting so worked up over it. And this is a mentality I've only recently adopted the last year, where if you, whether you lose that CSGO game or lose that competitive game, it's not gonna matter in a year. Obviously, I always do put in 110% to try and win, but I don't let it get to me if I lose. But when you get dogpiled by bots, I find that even more tilting, knowing I wasn't beaten by a human who was just better, but I was beaten by lines of code. And in Invade and Annex, it's pretty simple. You have to get to certain places on the map and you can complete certain objectives or just hold control of the area. And compared to King of the Hill, the maps are much larger and you find yourself traveling much greater distances, which is why I just love hopping in a helicopter and flying to the zone. And it feels really cinematic at times times as the helicopter comes in and you in a full helicopter bails out under fire and you're throwing smokes just shooting in the general direction. And there, another reason why I don't really like this game mode is because I don't know if there's something wrong with me, it probably is, but I can't see the enemy half the time. I'm just blind firing. My teammates, who I'm, con I'm convinced they're also bots as well, because they're able to see the enemy and shoot them. And when I look where they're shooting, there's no one there. It's like they're shooting at ghosts, but some servers can be strict in the sense where you have to communicate and others can be a lot more casual, but you can play this game mode with the standard armor assets, which is a lot more futuristic than our current timeline, or you can play a similar but not the same game mode with the Prairie Fire DLC, which involves flying to a part of the map and gaining control of it. And the type of map can change, but Cam Lao Nam, my I apologize. Despite heavily covering the Vietnam War on this channel, I still can't pronounce Viet names to save my life, but this map is massive, and it includes many historical locations such as Saigon, Hue, and even parts of Laos. And this is probably my favorite thing to do in all of armor. Just the feeling of hopping in a Huey or a little bird, looking over the countryside that has been absolutely bombed, yet still feeling calm. Until you get near the AO and you can see traces from God knows who going in every direction. It's 10 times worse and awesome if it's pitch black and as you're trying to hug the wall and the only thing that you have for a light source is the occasional flare and heli getting lit up for flying too carelessly. The, uh, just really upsets me though that this DLC runs like absolute dog crap and actually armor as a whole runs pretty shitty because I average around 30 to 40 FPS with my specs and it can inhibit the experience. But on the other hand, what other game lets you play on a map of this size within this theater of war? And it's that supply and demand or very little of it that makes me coming back to armor, make, makes me coming back, makes me come back to armor on a regular basis to play this specific expansion. But speaking of, 
of coming back to this game, what I say is the most used way of Armor 3, and it isn't playing on one of the servers on the server browser, it's a heavily modded co-op games. If the base game lacks something that you want, whether that is depiction of real world armies, even more advanced game mechanics, a Geneva suggestion, or <laughs> improvements to sound and animations, which I agree those haven't aged too well, or even new missions and similar things things that are in a paid DLC but are completely free like the unsung mod when you compare it to the Prairie Fire DLC. And a couple of mods that I've been playing with lately adds the MiG-29 and the F-18 Super Hornet and it's just been heaps of fun playing with a mate, getting into dogfights and having a laugh and that's the point of this game. That's what's special about armor because tomorrow we can just uninstall those mods and we can modify the game so we're doing spec op missions in Vietnam or bullying people in Altus life. And this is also why I reckon armor 3 will almost never lose its player base or anytime soon because while it can be jank in a fair amount of areas, there's very little like it. The only game that could topple it is Armor 4, yet again that'll take a while until the mods catch up, which I'm pretty sure is why Reforger is a thing, but that's a whole different oh, argument. Okay. But if it's similar to Armor 3 in terms of content, but has that fancy game engine, and it runs all the content above 60 FPS, I will drop a hefty amount of money to get Armor 4. And there's obviously games like Operation Harsh Doorstop, which does have a fair amount to do before we can get up to a more acceptable I don't want to go into that, I've made a multiple videos of that in the past, but if you like today's video then I do recommend that you check the video that is on screen because I know you'll enjoy it. And if you did enjoy this video please do consider leaving a like, subscribing, sharing the video with your friends. Anyways, my name is Tantu and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.